Hello all, this is Corey Lambertson with Whitmix Corporation, again coming at you with the second uh, session for the Temporary Design and Temporary 101. Uh, today we're going to cover the 3D printing part, the additive manufacturing part of the digital temporaries, so we're very excited to get started. And uh, I'm sure you guys remember the, the guys from Monday, but please guys go ahead and introduce yourselves. Uh, I'm Bryce, uh, Bryce Hiller with Whitmix Corporation. I work with Corey uh, in tech support. Um, and uh, yeah, most of you probably already know me and most of you probably probably talk to me on the phone uh, on the regular. Um, but I, uh, I do a lot of tech support here, um, answering phone calls, emails, um, some other stuff around, around the office too. Uh, usually I'm from home, but as you can see, I am back in the office today. Uh, not my office. I wish it was my office. Um, but uh, yeah, feels good to be back in, uh, at, least, at least for a couple of days here. Um, hopefully things are going to start getting back to normal and we'll start seeing all of our uh, co-workers, lovely smiling faces again. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm Bryce. <laughs> I'm Brandon. Um, I work for 3Shape as a trainer, um, so I do mostly um end user and reseller trainings and then i also do um a lot of educational events and things for three shape um and i also used to work for uh whitmix doing technical support and training there as well um i am still currently working from home no real end in sight yet um but i can still do most of my uh duties here from from home so um glad to be here Thank you guys, appreciate it. So today we're gonna cover the 3D printing aspect of the digital temporary design. So with that, we're gonna be using the Dentka uh, crown and bridge material. This was just released in Chicago. So let me hold it up close so you guys can see it. Uh, so we're very excited to be printing with this. And then we're gonna be talking about our two printers that we sell here at Whitmix. We have the Asiga Max, which I will adjust the camera so you guys can see it better once we get started. The Asiga Max, which is our powerhouse uh, 3D printer, and then also the Verabuild Whitmix printer, which is that that uh, it's a solid, great printer to get you into 3D printing and get started. Uh, even as a 3D printer at a dental office, it's going to be a, a solid printer in that scenario as well. Uh, so we're going to cover both these printers and the material for that. Uh, now we're only covering the 3D printing aspect of it. And a lot of people are probably wondering, can I still mill my temporaries? Can I mill it from the design? Uh, and I'll let you guys answer it. You know, what, you know, what are some advantages of milling over 3D printing and 3D printing over milling temporaries and, and uh, so on and so forth? Yeah, I mean, just like anything else, there's pros and cons to, to, to each option. Um, 3D printing is gonna be faster a lot faster when it comes to 3D printing temporaries. Um, Corey's gonna go through it, but just off the top of my head, you can probably print a full build plate of temporary uh, temporary crowns in, I don't know, probably like 20, 25 minutes tops, I would say, maybe even faster than that. Um, whereas, you know, if you were to mill that same amount of uh, uh, temporary crowns, you're looking at like, you know, probably, probably hours, honestly, um, yeah. depending on your mill and your milling strategy. Um, uh, and you know, there's some other there's some other pros and cons to each. You know, these are two very different types of manufacturing. So when we talk about 3D printing, uh, Corey mentioned that that we're going to be talking about additive manufacturing, uh, which means we're basically uh, we're we're basically creating our object out of uh, out of out of negative space essentially, um, or as uh, subtractive manufacturing is we're subtracting that from from pre-existing material. That's what milling is. Um, the, the advantage to, to additive is there, there are fewer restrictions. So, uh, you know, when, we're, when we talk about milling, there's a physical tool that has to subtract that material. Uh, that causes, I mean, that, that introduces limitation. That's why you have to apply drill compensation, which is removing more material than you necessarily need to um, in relation to the actual preparation. Um, so, so, you know, you're, you, you, if you have limit, really limited space, um, you know, drill compensation is going to remove even more material from that, depending on the restoration. Um, whereas uh, with, with 3D printing or additive manufacturing, you don't have to use any kind of drill compensation because there's no physical tool that is actually um, uh, subtracting material from, from, uh, from, a, from a disc. 
um, those are those are two of the the main ones. Milling's probably going to be uh, a little more expensive when it comes to, to temporaries, um, depending on the PMMA that you're using. Uh, 3D printing is a is a very affordable option. I would say, I mean, in that bottle of Dent Caresin, um, I don't I don't know for sure. I don't know, Corey, if you've done any testing on this, but I would guess you could get like. I mean, probably probably several hundred temporary crowns out of that bottle. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, mean, I mean, quite a few. Maybe maybe a thousand individual crowns, honestly. Yeah, and we can cover the cost of it. Um, I mean, what is the cost of PMA temporary material like a puck cost? I mean, I don't I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, it depends where you buy it from. If it's like if it's monochromatic, you can probably get them from for like I don't know, maybe like forty bucks. You start talking about multi layer, obviously the price is going to go up. Right. And how many units do you think you can get out of that puck? Um, I don't know. PMMA, maybe like 30. Okay. You're just talking about single units and probably 30 anterior units if you're to go with yeah, posterior. Yeah, prob probably. Okay. I mean, I mean, typically in a disc of zirconia, you're going to get around like, you know, around 20, give or take a few units. And that's yeah. scaled up. So, you know, yeah. and typically you're scaled up about 25%. So, you know, add 25% gotcha. or so onto that, to that zirconia unit. Gotcha. number and so, that's probably going to be where you're at i gotta throw some throw some sticker shock at you then uh this is 500 dollars. so this material is 500 dollars for a kilogram however we will break down when we're using the asiga composer software what that per unit cost is so right now bryce is at uh i think he said it you know if he gets about let's say if he gets 20 units out of a puck and if it's forty dollars for just a basic monochromatic uh material you're going to be looking at two dollars per unit so we'll cover exactly how much it costs per unit i'm going to say it's going to be maybe 20 25 cents 50 cents per unit if not less than this so pretty exciting there the um there's something else we didn't talk about what about um i mean with the advantage of milling you do have the ability to do the multi-layer so there is an advantage with that. So if you're looking for more of that aesthetically pleasing uh, temporary, then you can do that. But as Brandon said on Monday, if you make it too pretty, your yep. patient's not going to come back to you. They're going to be satisfied with it, and you may not want to do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe you have to put some strategy behind it of actually, you know, maybe going a shade darker than what is existing there, just so you know the patient's going to come back. Um, yeah. But – uh looks like we did have a question in it says what happens with cement space when printing is there any spacing provided so that's a good question but it's actually done on the design side so when you set that cement gap in your design or that spacing that internal offset it's going to keep and retain the same internal offset when it comes out of the printer so if you tell if you told it to have a you know hypothetically speaking let's say 50 micron cement gap then it's going to still retain that same 50 micron cement gap in the printed form as well. So that was a good question. So I want to show a couple you things. To, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, you also have to keep in mind that the way that these temps are designed through three shape, they're made as shell temporaries. So they're not actually to the actual prep tooth. You're designing something that's going to be under prepped so that when the clinic actually preps that tooth it's going to be way smaller than the internal fit of that so you're going to have tons of space in there and then when you go to reline it that's when it will fit down to that that prep just like if you were making a temp in the office now do you have a recommendation of a reline material at all or do you um, know what you you have i guess worked with in the past brandon it, it really depends on the material that you're making it out of. Now, if you're 3D printing, those are actually light cured materials basically that you can add with. So with yeah. those, you don't tend to have to give any kind of mechanical retention inside for the materials to bond together. But if you're using like a milled PMMA, you do have to add a little bit of roughness in there so that the uh, composite material sticks to the inside. Gotcha. Yeah, very cool. So uh, let's talk about the actual materials themselves. So I want to go to, and if you guys can see the screen, I like to use Denka's website um, as a great source of finding the IFU for the material. Uh, we don't have it yet on our website from Whitmix. We will be selling this material. Uh, it's just a matter of adding it to it. And right now with uh, the whole COVID-19 happening, we're limited on our human resources on uh, who we can have added to it. Uh, 
so from here, if you go to the Dentco website, right on the very first page, the very first banner that they have covers the crown and bridge material. So I'm just going to go ahead and select that. And then from here, on the crown and bridge material, it covers itself the actual uh, material properties. It talks about the flexural strength. Um, it also talks about the uh, degree of conversion and the density of the material. These are all extremely useful pieces of information when determining if you want to go with a milled versus a 3D printed restoration. But most importantly, if we go down to the bottom, there's a link that says download the instructions for use. So it's kind of hard to see on my screen. But this is extremely important before you start handling the material and before you start handling them with the printer or choosing the proper printer to be able to print the restoration in. So if I click on that, it pops up on my actual download of the RX, um, uh, sorry, of the actual Crown and Bridge IFU. And when we go to it, the most important part are the requirements. So it's talking about what printers are available to print this resin exactly. So we have the Zenith, which is a custom uh, printer that Denka uses. There's the Moonray, the S100, the Sega Max Pro 2 and Pro 4K. So the future printers that are coming out from a Sega are all added to the IFU. And then also we have the Accuretta FreeShape and the Whitmix Verbuild. Both of those printers are under the 510K with this material and under the IFU for this material exactly. So when we say 510K, what I'm referring to is it's a process. So it's FDA registered material with a 510K. And that 510K is covering the printer, the material, and the curing process. So we're going to see the curing process on Friday. Today, we're just going to cover the printer and the material. So on that note, Corey, one thing I do want to, to point out to people, um, and, and uh, you, what you're going to notice under the, the printers that, that you can that have a 510K for this resin, uh, this resin is a 405 resin. So you can print this on a 385 like your Sega Max, but also on a 405 like an LCD printer like a Whitmix Verabilt. Um, so I did want to specify that. So if you do have like a like an LCD printer, like a 405 printer that's not listed here, and you want to print some just to experiment or whatever, um, it can't. It is compatible with with 405 printers. Yeah. Good. Thank you. And then beyond the printer itself, so we have two of those printers here today. We have the Sega Max, and this is the 385 version, the ultraviolet version. And then we have the Whitmix Verabilt 3D printer. So we have two of those printers that are under that 510K umbrella. And then the next piece of equipment, which we'll see on Friday, is the curing unit. So the approved curing units, the providers, there's a Dymax, there's Electrolyte, there's Honol, and then there's Uvatron. So we're going to be seeing it uh, highlighted with the Uvatron curing unit. From there, there's also some, it talks about like printer information, but you can actually disregard the first part as long as your printer is listed under that first section here. However, there are some printing parameters that we have to follow. So there's some strict parameters for how we need to print this material. So for the ASIGA, we need to print it in 50 or 100 micron layers. So you can see that here for the Sega Max, 50 or 100 micron layers. And then the degree of orientation needs to be between 20 and 90 degrees. So 20 to 90 degrees, nothing below 20 and nothing greater than that 90 degree rotation. And then a contact support size of 0.7 to 1.5 millimeters and the density of the supports as well. We have similar settings for the Ver build. So we have to print it in a 50 micron layer thickness it has to be within 20 to 40 degrees of rotation and the point size it needs to be 1.5 millimeters so we're going to follow those uh, protocols when we go into the nesting software and we're nesting our restorations before we actually start printing and then after that it talks about the actual cleaning and the curing process we're going to cover that on friday so i'm going to leave this for friday so from here, uh, do we have any questions that popped up at all? And we can cover them. And then I want to talk about the two printers and talk about a little bit of the differences between the two. Yeah, so we got um, a couple questions here. Um, uh, so all provisionals are a shell. So yeah, um, when we when we say sh shell temporary, what we're referring to is a provisional, yes. Um, is there uh, is there a type of prep guide that could be made from the model cutback? 
uh, not in three shape. Um, and we kind of touched on that a little bit on Monday. Um, the reason being is, is F, I mean, basically FDA, um, FDA regulations. If the technician is making um, essentially a template for prepping the dye, that's going to be considered basically practicing uh, dentistry without a license. Um, so okay. that's, that's a no-go. Um, and then finally, what will be the cost of tray for the temp material? Uh, same cost as any of the other Asiga trays. So it, a one liter tray, which I highly recommend, is what you should be using for temporaries, um, is, is 85 bucks. Yeah, yeah. And there, you know, we can talk about, there are differences between the trays on these two printers and the costs associated with them. And also, of course, the build plate size and the overall technology. So I wanna first talk about between these two printers here, the technology itself, let me scoot in. The technology is this is a DLP projector on the Asiga Max, and then on the variable, it actually uses a LCD screen that is backlit with an array of LEDs. So I don't have the projector for the Max. However, I do have an LCD screen here that I'm going to unpackage and show the camera so you can see exactly what it looks like. The LCD screen has a lifespan of uh, it's rated for between three to four months, depending on the use of the printer itself. So the LCD screen is a temp or it's a, a consumable part. So if we take a look at it, it actually looks very similar. If you've ever taken your cell phone apart, it actually looks very similar to the LCD screen that you see inside of a cell phone. So same technology, it actually sits right underneath the resin vat inside of the printer. The LED light will project underneath and it will cure the image coming through. Now, Hey, hey Corey. Thinking, oh yeah. Yeah. Hey, real quick. Sorry, man. Um, can you stop sharing your screen? I I don't know if um, if you're sharing your screen, you might not be showing, or at least if you stop sharing your screen, maybe you'll be big for the audience. Okay. And also Sorry. for for oh no no that was, that was good. And then for anybody that is, if um if you want to make the actual webcam bigger, I believe if you put your mouse over one of our screens. You should have an enlarge option, which will make us bigger. And then also beyond that, I said to mine and now I'm huge. Shouldn't have done that. Let me go back. <laughs> All right. And then beyond that, you can also change the view. So if, if it says everyone on the webcam, if you click on the where it says everyone, you can change it to view presenter or who's talking and it should make it big screen. So just a, a little tip for anybody that's having a difficult time viewing us um, i can hold the the lcd screen back up because that may be what maybe somebody wanted to look at if they put a comment in uh, but this is what the lcd screen looks like and this is a consumable aspect that you'll be replacing on the VeraBuild 3d printer um, and the lifespan on that is about three to four months on what general use if you uh, if you use it more often than what general use is considered then you may be seeing it a two-month replacement um, However, this costs significantly less than what it costs to replace a projector in the Sega Max. Um, so the Sega How much Max are project, they? I, I think they're, I think it's a, th um, you know what? I should have, I should have looked that up. Um, I know what our cost is. I don't know what the, the, what the actual cost is. I want to say it's maybe, uh, I think a pack of three is either 200 or $300 um, for the LCD screens. So fairly inexpensive. The now the the Sega Max, the projector on that, if you were to ever replace it with a brand new one, it's six thousand dollars. And the actual life of the projector itself, we see that uh, they last for about two years, two and a half, three years, depending on general use. Once again, um, and it, the projector is still printing. It's what happens is the DLP chip overheats, and then you have stray mirrors. Uh, so that's something else to consider. Now, if we were to open up the printers themselves, so you can see if we were to put this under a shelf, the VeraBuild is slightly taller, so anybody considering it for like location. And then if we were to look at the build plates, they're actually quite similar in size. So you can see the VeraBuild is slightly bigger itself in size, but they are quite similar in size for the two different printers. Now there is going to be a huge difference in print speed. So uh, for example, a DLP printer is going to print a lot faster than what the LCD printer is. 
So I'm gonna go ahead and attach the build plates back in. Besides the technology and the build plate size, the other main difference is the actual tray itself. So I have a tray down here for the Vera build. Maybe, there we go. So these trays on the Vera build, they're an aluminum frame tray. So the actual frame itself, you would actually keep, and then you would replace the actual Teflon that's on the bottom side. Um, so it's a little bit different technique for the consumable side. And I'll show you what the Asiga Max tray looks like as well. So the Asiga Max tray. is actually a plastic tray itself. And then you cannot replace just the Teflon, you replace the whole tray itself. Now, uh, from your experience, Bryce, have you had an opportunity to clean a couple of the Verbuild trays at all yet? To, to clean them out? Clean them out and replace the Teflon? No, I haven't had to yet. Um, so as well, as you know, I've got, I've got one in my house, which I, I think I showed on Monday too. Um, I haven't had to yet. Um, I haven't had really, uh, I definitely haven't had one puncture. Um, haven't had, I mean, I guess that's a good thing, but no, I've right. not had to replace, I've not right. had to replace the Teflon. Right. Um, when you, whenever you do do it, it is, um, it is time consuming and it is a bit of a chore. And so I think the, you know, I have to double check to see what the Teflon costs for a replacement. I want to say you get, I think it's four four actual replacements for roughly a hundred dollars or maybe it's $150 is what he got $75 per. Um, and the amount of time it takes to, to replace it on this Ver build it, after I've done it a couple of times, it makes me really wish it had a consumable tray like the max. Now that's just the difference yep. in the type of person I am. So for me, you know, time is everything. You know, if I, if I was in an environment where I could spend more time, doing this, which is more, it's going to be cost effective. It doesn't bother me, but for, if I'm in a rush, I want to just go ahead and put in a new tray and start printing right away. So that is one of the other main differences between the printers themselves. And of course the manufacturer completely different um, and the software to use is completely different. So now that we've seen the printers and kind of touched on them, let's go ahead and let's, uh, what do you guys say we dive into the software next? Yeah. Um, one other thing I do want to mention, Corey, the, yep. In terms of the uh, one nice thing about the Vera build um, is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's the only dental printer on the market um, that every single component of it is user replaceable. And we actually, um, I think we have videos um, on how to replace just about every single piece of the printer. Like you can actually, the, the end user can pretty much tear the whole thing down and 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 replace anything uh, in, I mean, minutes. Um, right. which is really nice. That's, that's one, uh, that's one thing about the, the bear build that is very different than the Asiga. Uh, you cannot do that with the Asiga. You can't, you can't open the thing up and gut it and start swapping out parts. It's, you don't want, you don't want to do that. Um, right. the bear build you can, which is really nice. Right. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it, it is, you can completely disassemble and reassemble this, uh, this, uh, the bear build printer in no time. And there's videos showing how to do that completely. Um, we had a couple of questions. The LCD screen cost, I want to say it's, I, I think it's $300 for the, the for the three screen pack. Uh, the, how much is the projector on the max? If you were to buy a brand new projector, it's $6,000. However, they do have a refurbished program on the max. And that, that cost is, uh, it, by the time you get it shipped to us, shipped back, and replacement of the projector, it is uh, roughly fifteen hundred dollars, fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars, roughly. Um, that includes labor, replacement, uh, and actual testing of the projector, make sure everything's working. The replacement projector comes with a six-month warranty. The a new projector comes with a one-year warranty, uh, and the actual printer itself comes with a one-year warranty on the projector itself. So uh, that's something else to consider versus the LCD screens on the variable does not have a warranty because it is a consumable item uh, with it. Um, also, I have one more question uh, from Kevin at Artistic Dental. Uh, the answer is you have a you have two Asiga Pro 2 printers. So he was just asking, confirming which printer he actually has. 
so uh, from here, let me go ahead and run away. Not that you guys want to see my face, but just in case. Uh, we're going to cover the, the Asiga Composer software to start with. So remember, if you're using the Asiga Composer software for the very first time, and you're using it for the Denka Crown and Bridge material, you need to get that material file from Asiga's website. So I would go into asiga.com. And under asiga.com, when I'm under my account, I'm going to go to login. And under the login, I'm going to go to the email. So I'm going to go to, uh, I'm going to put in my account. So digital tech support. Output mix. So I'm going to log into my account. Now, any of uh, any of Sega users that we have currently today, you will have this same. Uh, you'll have a, a login information where you can log in, and then when you go to Material Library on the screen, you will see Dentka on the top right. So I'll click on Denka. And then from here, I can see the Denka Crown and Bridge material, and I'll just simply download it from the website. I already have it downloaded, so I'm not going to do that. But for any users that need that information, you will need to get it uh, from the website. For the VeriBuild, uh, we're working on a firmware and software release on this. With the latest software and firmware release, it will have the Denka Crown and Bridge material added to it. So to get started inside of the Asiga Composer software, I'm gonna create a new build. So this is just like before, so I'm gonna select new. And then from here, it's gonna open up the build properties window and I'm gonna choose my printer. So I'm gonna locate this printer, which is the Max Loner. And then I'm gonna choose my material. So I already have it selected for the Denka Crown and Bridge. And then I can choose my material thickness. They have it defaulted and programmed only for 50 micron layers. So I have it set for 50 microns, and then I'm going to select OK. So before this webinar, I was sitting there thinking, besides the temporary provisional shells that we can print, what are some other indications that we can print? So I was thinking, what about, I mean, I get your guys' opinion. What about doing, you know, instead of milling out your uh, full contour screw retain bridge out of zirconia and then, you know, verifying it fits, what about, 3D printing it as a temporary, as a as an actual prototype to try in to make sure everything works and the occlusion is right. I think that would be pretty cool. Yeah, um, I think that'd be pretty awesome too. And so yeah. I found an STL file of that. We'll use that and just think about the money that you're saving by printing that that actual bridge instead of milling it out of your zirconia, spending the time centering it and staining it and characterizing mm -hmm. it when you can add something just to try in. So I have an STL file that we'll import and I have a whole slew of STL files. So we can, we're gonna build and we're gonna fill up this build plate and see how long it takes yep. to print and see if we can prove Bryce right or wrong on his Ooh. prediction. Ooh. Another thing that you could uh, use this for is um, if you're opening the vertical and you're doing tabletops, you can verify that vertical opening with um, printing this at the tabletops and this just to make sure because this material is easy to adjust then you can scan it back in that's a good that's a good thought actually very good i didn't think about that i do not have any tabletops to print though <laughs> so i went ahead and we have i mean this is 10 11 stl files i'm gonna go ahead and just select them all and then select open and then I'm going to have them automatically place them in. So I'm going to select open again. And it automatically placed all of our files on the screen. So I'm going to go ahead and put this from an overhead view so we can see how many restorations. Now you can see I still have a lot of real estate on here to print. I did not grab enough. Um, so we have our screw retain bridge that we're going to play with as a as like a prototype. Uh, we have a, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven unit bridge. We have Brandon's placement jig for his, uh, for the design that he created. Uh, we have his temporary over here as well. A uh, couple of posterior temporaries, another three unit bridge. And then I did select another, uh, just a custom abutment as a printable option as well because you can still print that 
and trial that to make sure it even fits the tie base. What if you're questioning what tie base you were using? Instead of tying up your mill to mill that, just go ahead and 3D print it and save some time and money um, and energy. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at this, the orientation is not correct. So remember, in the instructions for use for the ASIGA, we need to have that 20 to 40 degree rotation, uh, or 20 to 90 degrees, sorry, for the ASIGA. And then we also need to have the, uh, we need to have the occlusal surfaces facing the build plate. So right here's the build plate to prevent any sort of supports being placed into a undesirable location. So I'm gonna go ahead and left click and we'll rotate them all over. So right here. Now you can see I'm clicking every single one and then rotating. There is a lot faster way. So I can go ahead and either I can highlight them all on the top left, or if I hold down the control key on my keyboard and then start selecting the ones that I need to rotate. Oops. I can rotate them all over at once. So unfortunately, there's no easy button to say snap to 40 degrees or snap to 20 degrees or snap to 90 degrees. So you will have to do each one of those individually. Or if I was to highlight them all, and if I was to rotate this till we got to 20 degrees. For hey, example, could, like you, so. could, you use the, uh, could you use the rotate option down in the transform panel? Absolutely. So I can also use the transform panel. So I could highlight all of these and tell it to that go is... on the, that'd be the Y direction. So rotate right here. And I can tell it to do 20 degrees. Oops. 20 degrees. And then if I just press down or if I was to press up, it's going to automatically adjust it to 20 degrees. Now we can see that half the restorations are purple the other half are actually in the yellow uh, that means that it's outside of the printing boundary so uh, i'm going to do i'm going to do an auto place function so i'll re-auto place it and then we'll apply our supports and actually get it to the printer itself so i'm going to apply so you can see now we don't have any objects overlapping each other And I'm going to go to my supports, and then I'm going to generate my automatic supports. Now, when we come in here, we can see that there is a, um, what I'm looking for here is the contact width. So it actually stated in the IFU that the contact width for the Asika printers need, be to, need to be between 0.7 to 1.5. So I'm going to go ahead and put that to 0.7 millimeters and then we'll hit apply. Now I have printed with the supports at 0.4 millimeters and it actually does a pretty good job. Um, so I was quite pleased to see that. Uh, something that you can do if you print it with that 0.4 or 0.4 millimeters with that contact point the actual supports peel right off. Uh, the reason why they're going with a thicker support, what they're recommending is to prevent the object from moving during the printing process. Also, if you're printing a very small structure, sometimes the supports can delaminate as well. So just something to think about. You do have the ability to play with those supports, but that may be, make the difference between a pass and fail situation on the build plate. All right, so I went ahead and got it nested. In so we can see our supports. So the next step is to actually send the job to the printer. But before that, I want to go ahead and actually see what all of this is going to cost me to print. And it's going to include this cost of the supports as well. So I'm going to go up to, it looks like a time clock. It's a build time estimator inside of the composer software. And I have the cost of the material itself already pre-programmed in for $500 a liter. Eleven dollars and sixty-one cents. That's insane. That. That's yeah. insane. I mean, because if that if you were to mill that in a puck, I mean, you'd have to use mm -hmm. at least. I mean, you wouldn't be able to get it all in one puck because you have that large oh. bridge, you have the, mm -hmm. the placement jig, and you have that other seven-unit bridge. You know, you wouldn't yeah, be able I mean, to. You're looking at like you, yeah, you're looking at like seventy to hundred bucks to mill that probably. 
yeah. when you factor into a life. Yeah, yeah. And if you were to include, like, so for example, um, it uses a total volume of 22 milliliters of print and the actual, if you were to print that with your, uh, with a one liter tray, so the one liter tray only allows one liter of use through it, you're, you'd are you be looking at, uh, you'd still have, what, that's 97% life left on your tray mm -hmm. after printing that. So yep. you can see it's going to take a long time to be able to burn through it. You spent 97%, so that'd be like $2 of your tray life as well. So you're looking at a total usage of maybe $13, $14, including the actual tray cost and the actual material cost. So something to, to consider. So from here, I'm going to go ahead and let's send this to the printer and we'll start the job and then we'll jump over to the Ver build and see the difference in the software there. So from here, the final step and just to recap what we've done, we've created a new build. We've added in our parts. We went ahead and nested them and rotated them. We've added our supports. And then the final step is to actually send the job to the printer itself. So from here, the first page under the build wizard is to show the generic information about the printer, talk about the material. We're going to go ahead and select next. And we're going to put a base plate. I like to use 0.3 millimeters below the supports. And then shadow supported parts only. We're going to have separation detection on. And then I'm going to turn on fast print mode. Brett, made a liar out of you. It's going to you take one hour, one hour, 16 minutes, and 23 oh, seconds to it, print this. Yeah, it's because that all on four is really tall. <laughs> if you were doing just yeah. single units, it'd probably be like you yeah. know, half of that or less. It would, actually. When we're done with this, we'll go ahead and um, or after I send this over, I'll go ahead and I'll delete it just to have Brandon single unit, and let's see what that takes to print. Yeah. So I'm going to send select next. These are all the advanced parameters. We're not going to change any of those because those are – Perfect. And then we're going to name this. We'll call this temp print. And from here, I'm going to go ahead and select send build. So it's going to send the job over. I got the warning that says 72 duplicate facets. We're just going to hit ignore for that. So while that's going, a couple questions. Um, why do we need to rotate the units? Um, the biggest reason that I can see, if you print, let's say you're doing like a you know, like a molar, you're printing just a single molar um, temporary crown and you have it supported on the occlusal just perfectly vertically. You're going to get to a point where that margin is going to come to a feather edge. And even if you're printing in thin layers like 50 microns, you're eventually going to get to the point where the basically the closest your margin is going to be is going to be 50 microns because it's, hor because it's perfectly horizontal. Um, so, but by angling that, you know, Instead of your margin printing, you know, up like up like this, if you angle it, you're going to get better accuracy at that margin because it's 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 a, a it's a lesser degree that it's printing, I guess, of that margin in each layer. If that makes sense. It does. So that's I mean that's going to be the biggest reason. I, again, I know these are temporaries, um, so that that margin isn't going to necessarily be the exact margin but it's still it's still the, the principle of the matter um, yeah. for for the best accuracy of those you know those um, really thin intricate areas uh, by angling it you're going to get you're going to get better accuracy yeah um, what's the difference of the life of the printed material versus milled material pma in the mouth um, does it say uh, on that label Corey, for the denco what how, how long it's indicated for in the mouth Probably six I months. I actually, I think it's 30 days. 30 days? Okay. Let me see. Um, okay. The crown, Denka Crown and Bridge is a light curable photopolymer days. resin to fabricate by additive manufacturing temporary crowns and bridge to be used for less than 30 days. Okay. Um, cool. Let's see. This has a, it has an asterisk, so let's see if that. Uh, Looks like it doesn't relate to anything. Okay. Yeah. So that should be fine for your regular crown and bridge. Um, you know, I, if if you if if you have a temporary in for longer than thirty days, I mean, I'd be I mean, it's I'm surprised it'll even stay in. You know, if, 
a lot of times temporaries will come out way sooner than that. So um, just because they be, they become like unbonded. Um, yeah. But that should be fine. I mean, so you know, if you're if you're if you're wanting to use this for it's like a provisional for an all in four, you know, maybe you know that's not that's not going to be long enough uh, potentially. So, um, right. but for regular crown and bridge, it's not. It shouldn't be an issue. Well, technically, you could print two. Or you could print two. Yeah, that's absolutely so right. So you could print the one, have it in, and then you could do a 30-day checkup with the patient, mm -hmm. make sure that you know there's no issues with the design itself, um, yep. test drive it. You know, and then from there you can always place in a second one. Yep. Um, can you tilt the angle on all of the all on four to or less to shorten the print time? Yes. Yeah, you can. Um, obviously, any deal, any 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 printer that is printing in layers, whether it's LCD or DLP, the shorter your objects um, or the shorter vertical you're printing, the less time it's going to take. So yes. Yeah, that you can do. The reason why I didn't is because I was following the IFU strictly. Um, you know, if you're a rule breaker, then go ahead and you can put it to to no rotation whatsoever, and it would have it would have cut. I would say it probably would have cut 30 minutes off the print if I was to have all of these parallel and horizontal to the build plate. But you know, that, that was from that was from Ray, and I have a feeling Ray's a little bit of a rebel. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think he might be. Yeah, yeah. Um. We've got, uh, were the previous webinars, like on Monday, recorded for viewing? Yes, they were. Uh, if so, where can they be found? Um, yeah. I will, we will type in the link to that question to answer it for you. Yeah. Um, uh, man, a lot of questions. Um, when printing models and dies, are they too, are they too needed to be placed in an angle? Um, no. Uh, you do you want to. Yeah, you want those to be as horizontal to the build plate. While you're asking those questions, I'm going to go ahead and kick off the print real quick. Yeah. So let me, um, if if everybody wants to watch the screen while Bryce is asking the rest of the questions, I have on here, uh, let's see, it has a printer web interface so you can see the touch screen of exactly what I'm doing. So I'm going to select print. I'm going to select the build. This is temp print. I'm going to select that again. I'm going to select continue and yes. And it's going to start printing right away. All right, go ahead with your question. Sorry. Uh, you should be. <laughs> <laughs> um, will the angulation affect the screw retained access hole? You know, I haven't noticed that. Have you, Corey? I mean, I haven't. I haven't seen any issues um, printing those those screw access channels at an angle or vertically. I have not with okay. printing on. Um, you know, as long as you stay with within, oops, made a mess. If as long as you stay within those guidelines mm -hmm. of the of the uh, 10 to or 20 to 60 degrees or 10 to sorry, 20 to 90 and 20 to 40, depending on which printer you own, um, you're not going to have you shouldn't have any fitment. Now, if you are having fitment issues, my advice would be to put it as horizontal to the build plate as possible. And so I would flatten it. That will give you the most accurate fitting especially for the screw retained bridges yeah and one other thing that i've noticed when 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 you try to print um or if you're having issues with like your tie bases fitting honestly the for what i found the biggest culprit to be um excess resin in this in that in the where that tie base is engaging with the actual uh screw retained restoration so um the dent co resins can be a little sticky um so what you may want to do if you if you're having fit uh, fit issues, just use like uh, when you do your alcohol wash, um, you can use like a like a really soft pipe cleaner or a really soft like um, uh, uh, like soft bristle toothbrush, and use and when you're doing your alcohol bath, just use that and kind of get in that that little channel and see if that fixes the issue. Um, if it does, it's a pretty good indicator that that all the resin isn't getting completely uh, cleaned out in the alcohol wash. I have seen that happen. Quite a few times, um, so so that's usually um, if you're having issues, that's usually a good place to start. Um, let's see, there's an asterisk. Device is registered in Canada as Class Two, which is used for less than 30 days. Yep. Um, okay. Can I use my Denka tooth material to print temps? Um, well, can is a question of ability. You certainly could. I would not recommend it. Um, the, that material was not formulated 
um, to to be used as a crown and bridge um, uh, uh, prosthesis. Uh, it, was, it was specifically engineered for denture teeth. And obviously the big difference there is on a crown and bridge temporary, there's a cavity. On a denture tooth, there's not. Uh, I wouldn't try it um, personally. Uh, a, it's definitely not FDA approved. Um, that's not an, that's not an approved indication for it. And B, um, the I, I, the denture tooth uh, resin is just probably not going to be as strong, to be quite frank. Um, so I, I wouldn't. I would just buy the the um, crown and bridge resin. Um, where can we print the quizzes for the webinars? Uh, good question. Uh, we will link that uh, also in your to your question. Uh, when will you guys set up the contest for Whitmix t-shirts? No, it's a good question. We need to do that, Corey. Yeah, we'll have to talk with sales and marketing to um, to to actually get it into a play. I know when we were, I think we were spitballing the first webinar when we talked about the contest, but we'll have to actually uh, enforce <laughs> enforce what we put behind it. Uh, you know, I think it's just a matter of time once we get out of this COVID slump where we can really invest a lot of resources in that. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, so I went ahead and if everybody can see on the screen, I went ahead and took that single crown that Brandon, or that single temporary that Brandon designed, I times it by a hundred. I can still see that there's quite a bit of real estate left. Uh, the actual, if I was to print a hundred of these, the cost of this, if you're ready for it, five dollars 42 cents <laughs> and uh, awesome. and we're gonna make we're gonna we're gonna take away that Colin Bryce a liar it's gonna take 23 minutes and 33 seconds boom nailed it <laughs> so he, he feels better now about his ego yes I guess. so um spot but, on. yeah so that's uh yeah he was he was spot on with it and we can see we could probably fit I mean, I would probably say maybe another 20 on here. So maybe 120 units, um, the cost maybe goes up a buck, you know, so that's uh, crazy. And we've only used 10 milliliters of resin. Uh, there's roughly about 900 and uh, it's about 920, 910 milliliters in a jug of resin, depending on the weight. Uh, and so you're using a, what, 1%, almost 2% of yeah. the material. So crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. So yeah, you're definitely going to be able to get like, more than a thousand yeah single yeah. individual units yeah so the sieg is going so the next printer we need to fire off is the variable itself so i'm going to go ahead i'm going to close out of the asiga actually i'll just minimize it i need to close out of it and i'm going to go ahead and open up what is called alpha 3d so this software is the software that's used for the uh for the variable so right when we go into the software, this is very similar to how the Asiga software is. We need to go ahead and choose a printer model. Um, so we only have one variable at this point in time. And then we need to select the material we want to print in. So we can see we have all the Wimix resins. And then also I have imported the Denka resins as well. Uh, so the Denka Dentia resins are validated on this printer uh, along with the Denka Crown and Bridge. Um, our Vera, our Vera model materials, OS, the the golden brown, the gray, the white, um, and the new ivory. So that was just released. That is also available to be printed on this printer. And then beyond that, we have our surgical guide material. Uh, so I'm going to choose the Denka crown and bridge. And then I'm going to put it down to 50 micron layers, because remember, that's what the IFU said it had to be by. So I'm going to go ahead and hit apply. And then I'm going to go ahead and import in my files. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to import my files again and select open. Now you're going to notice with this software, I mean, it uploaded and imported extremely fast. However, it did not go ahead and automatically nest it. So it does not have a auto nest upon importation feature like the Asiga Composer software has. So that's one of the different advantages you have with the Asiga. Uh, beyond that, the next step is to go ahead and look at it from a top point of view. We're going to go ahead and nest the structures. So I'm going to go ahead and tell it to uh, automatically nest. And so it's going to go through and nest the structures for us. 
So you can see it was able to fit all the objects on the build plate, still quite a bit of space. And then from here, we do need to go through and actually uh, rotate all the structures. So I am going to go ahead and rotate the screen. And unfortunately, there is not a select on all function like we had with the Sega. So each one of these you are going to have to do manually. Even if I hit the control key, it does not allow me to select more than one. So one of the disadvantages. So remember, this has to be, uh, when this gets imported in, we need to put it between a uh, 20 to 40 degree rotation. So I'm going to go ahead and rotate it back so it's parallel, and then we'll put it at that roughly 20 degree rotation. Um, so you have to do that for each one of these individually. So we'll have to spend a little bit of time here. Uh, in the meantime, while you're doing that, uh, you have a question. What would be the protocol to print provisionals based upon a digital mock-up like Smile Design to fit actual preps from an intraoral scanner like I tear while a patient is in operatory. Um, what would be the protocol to print? I mean, at that point, what you would do is just print them as, or design them as if they were just normal crowns. Um, yeah. Where you could mark the margin and run through the normal crown and bridge design. Um, you could bridge them together if you wanted, or do them all as single units. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that'd be the easiest. Get those questions in, people. You got them. Now's the time to ask. I do have a question uh, for Bryce or Corey. Um, yeah. On the what? What is the duplicate facets uh, error mean when you when you're in the composer software? Yeah. So it's just um, it, honestly, I. It's not super relevant. Uh, what it's referring to is like where the supports actually meet your your STL file, your object. There's basically duplicated data triangles there. Um, you can just ignore them. It's not a big deal. You can you can click honestly you can click ignore or discard. Uh, to me, I, I haven't noticed any discernible difference between whichever one you choose. Uh, but you can just click ignore. It doesn't it's not it's not super relevant. It's just letting you know that there's like duplicated uh, data triangles. Not a big deal. Okay. So I think I got it. So uh, if we if we take in the amount of time, it took this like two seconds to go ahead and or okay that was a lie probably like ten seconds to go ahead and and re-nest and put it in the proper orientation. And for the software for the very build, it took me maybe two or three minutes. So something to consider when looking at the different printers. So I'm gonna go ahead and re-nest it. And then we're going to go ahead and apply our supports. So from here, I'm going to go to supports. And for this, I'm going to go to uh, the auto supports. But remember, if we go back to the IFU, it has to have a point size of 1.5 millimeters, so significantly greater. Uh, and then the support density, let me go back to that because I don't have it memorized. The support density it has 0.3 to 0.5. Let's or three to five. Seventy to seventy to eighty percent. Okay, and like okay, perfect. So it's at seventy six percent. So that's good. Uh, so from here, I do like to change the type of structure. So there is one advantage to the composer or to the Alpha three D software that it has over Composer, and it's the way that the supports are generated. There is a uh, a, uh, a structure style support, which is if you look at the screen, it's actually number two right there. So I like to go ahead and set it to structure. And then I'm going to go ahead and just auto support. So another thing is I have to click on every single one of these now and auto support it. I'm not going to lie. That's the, the structured supports. That's the one thing I wish a CEO composer had. I wish it had that. Because um, yeah. when you print taller objects, um, like, like if you've got denture base wanna... plates vertically, they want to, yeah, they want to shift just, to, not shift, but um, almost compress a little bit, wiggle, yeah, wiggle, 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 yeah. Uh, and those, I, I really wish Sega would add in support structures like this as an option. Um, 
that doesn't seem like yeah. it would be that difficult to do. So maybe, you know, maybe that's something that we can email them about and ask. Yeah, so we can see how it looks right here. And then beyond that, the next thing I need to do is, um, with the way this is oriented, I'm going to add some more supports. So I can see that there's some areas that looks like it needs some extra supports that the software would have missed, uh, which we don't have that issue ever with the Composer software. So I do have to go through and reanalyze. And this um, this comes in just year I mean, experience in printing, but there's a slicer view on the left-hand side. And when I come through here, what I yep, saw I right away, right mm -hmm. here, See the little island? That's something that I'm going to have to manually check for this. So I'm going to go ahead and do manual support. Oop. Select on the object and then do uh, manual support. And let me put this so it's completely apparent. I'm going to go ahead and just add in some extra support, especially where we see that heavy red. Um, I can also change this if I change the support density. The closer we are to Let's say if we go to 80, oops. Hey, let me go back to turn off the manual support. So I put it to 80. Let's go ahead and see what auto support does for that and see if it fixes it. So it still didn't get it. And so we can keep increasing it and go to 90. What exactly, Corey, what, what is support density? I believe it's looking at the, it's analyzing the surface and it's saying, okay, according to the surface of the red, um, if we increase that number, it's going to increase the support density, like how many supports are in that region. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do have a question from the group. Uh, what does the red indicate? Red is indicating overhang structures. So supports that are, are areas where supports are needed in that general region. Mm -hmm. So I went ahead and I increased it to 90 and it did make a difference there. So the other restoration that I was kind of iffy about is look at this guy right here. It has one support going to it. So I'm going to go ahead and auto support that. And I'm going to still manual add a couple extra. Now, it may look like I'm overdoing the supports, but honestly, for me, it's a lot easier to finish it down, the little support nubs, than it is to reprint it um, the mm -hmm. amount of time it takes. So uh, from here, we have our objects. In. So if we go ahead and rotate the screen around, we went ahead and reapplied supports. This looks good. It looks better. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and actually start the print job or slice it and then get it to the printer and start it. Uh, so this looks good. Just analyzing it one more time. Uh, all right. So from here, the final step is to go over to on the left hand side, which is slice and print your models. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to rename this. I called the other one temp print, so we might as well call this temp print as well. And I'm gonna go ahead and select save. So it's gonna go through the slicing aspect of it and it's gonna render the images and then we'll be able to send it to the actual printer. So the printer, to get the files to the printer over here, we do have a couple more options. So you can either use a USB stick to transfer the files. You can send it through the internet, like Wi-Fi or ethernet connection. However, when you do that, you have to have this printer connected to the network and you have to use the printer web interface. So I'll show you that here in a moment and how to get it through the printer web interface. This may take a couple seconds. So if you guys have any more questions, please feel free to feel free to send them over and ask us. There's gotta be some, you guys gotta have some questions for us. There's one. All right, Ray's never letting us down. Looks like the, the type of support uses different amount of materials. Yep, uh, does this affect cost and time? Time, no. Uh, it will vary very slight. I mean, it, the amount of cost that you're going to add by switching that type of support is going to be honestly negligible. Yeah. You, you, you will never, you'll never notice the, the difference in cost. I mean, you're talking honestly like maybe a couple cents per build yeah. in, that, in that support yeah. chart. I mean, very little. Yeah. That's a good question. I mean, though. is a dollar worth having a more accurate structure? I mean, how much? <laughs> what is is twenty dollars worth having a more accurate structure? You know, I mean, so I mean, it's, I'm not saying it costs twenty dollars more to print with that style of support, but what does it cost? You know, what are are you really worried about twenty, thirty cents, or even a dollar, even ten dollars, twenty dollars for a more accurate 
device or a full build plate of structures. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So from here, um, I have the printer web interface open. So this is what it looks like. So I typed in the IP address of the printer and then I'm gonna go ahead and upload the files. So I'm gonna go ahead and select on files. So choose the print file and then the printer on drop down. So I'm gonna go ahead and add it in. So on the center bottom, there's an add button. I'm gonna go to the file. So there's a directory location where the print file is saved. So it's uh, 3D print data, 3DP data. And I'm gonna select on the file itself that was generated. So I went and selected on that. You guys just saw Evan walk through the background maybe. Mm -hmm. So it's uploading the file. And then here in a moment, we'll go ahead and actually start the print job. Um, another major difference between the two printers, or not major difference, but it is a difference, is the cost. So that's something we did not say earlier. Bryce did cover that last on Monday, but you do pay for a difference in, in print technology and printer itself. So remember this printer here, uh, in the States, it costs $3,500 for the Vera build. For the uh, Sega Max, you're at $10,900. Uh, so on the screen, it says, is the upload completed? So I'm going to go ahead and select on the upload so we can see now it's an option. I'm going to select next. It's going to default to the material. So I have my Denka Crown and Bridge material in here. And then I'm going to go ahead and select print. So from here, it says check to make sure that we have the proper material in, which we do. We'll select print again. And now the printer is going to go ahead and start printing. And we will be able to see a print time estimate here in a moment. So we'll be able to see, you know, firsthand the actual difference in time it takes to print this, uh, these structures that we have on the build plate versus the max versus the actual bare build. So right there, I don't know if you guys can see on the screen, it's estimating that this print job here, which is the same one that we have on the Asiga, is going to take essentially four times as long. And it's going to take four hours and 16 minutes to print the same amount of restorations, restorative work that we have on the Asiga. So the other difference is time, which we talked about earlier. The the if time is extremely important to you, if you're a production laboratory, then the Sega Max is going to be in the direction that you want to go. If you're, you know, if if you're a boutique laboratory and you don't have the output that you need, or if you're specializing on, or if you have a special interest item, or if you're just getting started on 3D printing, then the Vera build is a great way to go as well. But just remember, the time it takes to print is going to be significantly longer on the Vera build when comparing it to the Astiga. Now, if you compare the Vera build to, let's say, uh, uh, what's a, uh, the Formlabs printer, it is going to be faster than the Formlabs printer. So you do have that advantage there. So uh, if you guys just want to wait around for about four hours, we'll go ahead and take a look at it. And <laughs> I don't think, uh, I mean, <laughs> we got time to kill. So now this actually, um, this is step two of this process for Temporaries 101. So remember step one, we saw the scanning and designing part. Step two, we're seeing the printing, nesting part. And then step three, we're gonna see the finishing part on Friday. Uh, so if you have any other questions, we have a couple more moments and then we'll go ahead and conclude this session. Yeah, um, we have a couple. Uh, is there an indicator in the software that lets you know how close the projector is to expiration? Nope. Uh, there is no indicator on either of these printers um, in regards to the, um, I guess, lifespan of the projector and or the LCD screen. So no. That'd be nice, though, but no. Um, yeah. We had one question about the accuracy between these two printers. So the XY resolution, the pixel resolution on the Sega Max is 62 microns. The pixel resolution on the Vera build is, is it 47? Mm -hmm. 47. 47. So um, you are going to see actually slightly, probably slightly increased accuracy with the Vera build. Um, that is that is a nice thing about LCD technology is it is more scalable uh, because you can just make a bigger screen technically. Uh, whereas right. a projector, you you have to the 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 resolution of that projector has to increase exponentially as you move farther away from the build the build area. Right. Um, so yeah, you will see slightly better accuracy out of out of the Vera build. But I mean, to be quite honest, 
I don't know if you're going to see enough for it to be clinically significant. To be quite frank with you, I don't. I don't. I, I'm not convinced I mean, of that. We're splitting hairs at this point. I mean, we're yeah, splitting. Right. We're splitting right. split hairs. Yeah, I mean, and, and just because. So, so you know, when when we look at 62 pixel resolution compared to 47, well, that's what a 15 a 15 micron swing. That doesn't mean that there's going to be. That doesn't mean that the that the variable is going to be 15 microns more accurate. It's not. It's not necessarily how it translates. Um, so I mean, you're probably looking. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm guessing here, but you're probably looking at maybe five microns of difference in accuracy. Um, where I mean, that's <laughs> yeah, that's very little. Um, yeah. I I would not I would not weigh accuracy uh, necessarily as a as a as a determining factor when you're choosing if you're choosing between these two particular printers. Right. Um, with re with the resin being light cured, do you normally print with the hood up? Nope, he's just doing that because uh, it's just demonstration. So that's yeah. definitely a hard no. Yeah. Um, what's the printing time difference again? Um, so what we're looking at on the Asiga with this particular build is just a little bit over an hour, and then on the Vera build we're looking at, at about four hours and between 15 and 20 minutes. So the Vera build is yeah. in this case about four times slower, uh, which is pretty significant. Um, are like these two of these for the price of the one or three? Yeah. yeah, almost three. Actually, yeah, three. Um, are these printers indicated more for lab purposes versus in an office? Yes, that is my answer. Yes, <laughs> either. Um, we we these are either of these are great options for both for both laboratories and in office. It just yeah. depends on your needs. I mean, if you're if you're a doctor. If you're looking for something chair side and need that speed, then the Seeger is going to be a better option because you can crank, you can pump out their temporary in 20 minutes. Great. They're, I mean, they're still in the chair at that point. Um, whereas on the Vera build, you know, they're going to be sitting in the chair for an hour before you get that thing printed. Um, if you're in a doctor's office and you're not necessarily doing this chair side, but you're just looking for something to print your models, or maybe your patient's coming back the next day and you're going to seat the temporaries, then the Vera build's a great option because it's it's very cost effective. Um, it's versatile and, you know, it, it's, it's got a slightly smaller footprint than the Sega yep. Max. So it's a, it's a really good option. So it, you know, it really just comes down to your needs. Um, these printers are not one size fits all by any means. Um, right. it, it, it's, it really comes down to you. What else we got people? Okay. Here's one. Uh, which do you suggest, uh, DLP, SLA, or LCD. So, so technically, these are both SLA printers. A SLA stands for stereolithography. These are both technically stereolithography printers. DLP and LCD are variations on that technology, as well as laser, which, like the Form Labs, is like a laser SLA printer. Um, and again, just like I said, it really depends on your needs. Um, there are pros and cons to each. We've gone over those I think, pretty in depth uh, up yeah. to this point. Um, it, it's it's really just it depends on what you're looking for. It depends on what you need to use this thing for. Right. Uh, post-processing at all. Yep. Obviously there's going to be post-processing just like any other 3d printed appliance. So you're going to do a five minute alcohol bath in a dirty bath and then five minutes in a clean bath. And those are going to be done in an ultrasonic. Uh, yep. We're going to be going over post-processing on Friday. So I'm not really going to get into that uh, super in depth right now because uh, I'd like to have a webinar on Friday instead of <laughs> not having one. Um, What's the speed and accuracy difference with the Asiga, uh, the Pro 4K, and the Max? It's a good question. Um, uh, the the speed-wise, they're going to be they're going to be I think about the same um, in yeah, terms they're, of speed. They're they're rated for the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty. It's for the most part, it's the same technology. Now, accuracy-wise, I think Corey maybe mentioned this, but I'll mention it again um, just so I can uh, shamelessly sales pitch the, the Pro 4K because it's amazing. Um, so, so a Sega added a new feature to these Pro 4Ks, um, and they're calling it Pixel Shift. And what? Uh, uh, 4K mode. Oh yeah, no, they changed the name. It's called it's called 4K mode. Um, and I'm not going to get into technically what it does, um, but it, it, it's going to bring the pixel resolution on the Pro 4K 80 down to 56 microns. Is that right? Yep. So that's super accurate. So. Um, uh, you know, technically on paper, it's going to be a little bit more accurate than the Sega Max, but again, kind of goes back to this, you know, that the difference between 56 and 62 microns is clinically insignificant. Right. Um, the, the Pro 4K is, uh, 
look out people because this thing is going to be um uh, uh really incredible and i don't say that because just because we sell them i do say that because we sell them. but seriously like um those of you that know me you guys know that i don't i don't i don't pitch a product if i don't believe in it i just that's not that's not who i am um but and these these pro 4ks are going to be uh these things are going to be stellar. Uh, I'm I'm super pumped about these. Yeah, we should have one hopefully this week or next week. So, fingers if we crossed do, we should we... do a, we should do a webinar on it. We will. Yeah, we yeah. will. Yeah, I already got um, it in the pipeline. Sweet. Um, let's see. A Sega is a DLP printer, correct? Uh, yep. Um, recommend to have backup in stock for the LCD plate. How much curing light? <laughs> so I think the I think the VeraBuild comes, doesn't it come with a pack of three uh, LCD yeah. screens or two? Yeah, so it comes with one installed and then two extra. So you technically yeah. get about yeah. roughly one year of life of LCD screens with the printer mm -hmm. itself. I would recommend as soon as you as soon as you go through the first LCD screen, go ahead and buy another one just to have on yeah. hand. Just um, like anything else. Yeah. So, and if you're not careful, those screens are fragile. And so if you break one upon installation, unfortunately, that's it. You know, so you'd have to buy, you'd have to have another screen, uh, which that's not covered under warranty if you break it. Yeah. Um, what's the big advantage of the Pro 4K? Uh, build volume. So the build plate is almost four times the size of the Max. I mean, it's huge. It's it's, yeah, it's, it's like, seriously like yeah, it's like it's it's like it's like hang on, it's like it's like this. It's like, where's the screen? At? It's it's uh, it's like this. Like this. So if that. <laughs> If you guys go to asika.com, you can actually see the build dimensions on there. Um, yeah. They they have an actual the the X Y and Z dimensions of it. It's it's almost I think it's like three a little greater than three times the size of the build plate of the Max. So. Um, and that's not yeah. even taking into account the Z axis. The Z axis is going to be what two twice and tw two and a half. Yeah. 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 So I mean, it's it's super awesome. And I don't know if I, I don't know if we mentioned this, but it's not a lease. Did you know that, Corey? Hey, it's not these a lease. Are, these are twenty-five thousand dollars, and you own it. It's not you a lease. To, you're telling me you get to own this printer, and you don't have to pay any sort of lease on it. Okay, what I'm okay, what I'm saying is you pay twenty-five thousand dollars, and you never have to give it back if you don't want it. If you don't want to, you never have to give it back. It's yours. Do it yeah. if you want to tie. If you want to, if you want to use it as a boat anchor, buddy, you can do it. So you're telling me I can own this printer, and it's mine, strictly mine. And it's not being regulated or watched over in any way. It's all mine. That is correct. At that point, you, you yes, you own it. It is cool. it is yours to do with as you please. Sign up um, for two. Yes, yes. Uh, would you recommend putting all of the equipment on a APC battery backup? Yeah, I mean that's yeah, that's never a bad idea for anything electronic, honestly. Um, one nice thing about I and I don't know I don't think I don't I doubt the Verabil does this Corey you you'll be able to tell me but the one nice thing about the Asiga Max uh, if you do lose power like in the middle of a print job you can actually pick back up where it was which is nice you can resume that build um, do you know if I doubt the Verabil does that no no no, such, so. no no such feature yeah there's no resume yeah uh. um, are there software and such fees. Uh, there are no fees. Uh, both of these products, you get lifetime support, um, uh, which means you can call me uh, anytime you want. Just nod on my cell phone, please. Uh, <laughs> uh, just kidding. If you absolutely have to, uh, since I'm working from home. But no, yeah, you can. You, these there are there are no annual fees on these machines. Uh, zero. Um, right. It's not it's not it's not our style. It's not what we do. Um, let's see. Did you? Guy sell a station wagon to Clark Griswold. Uh, I can neither confirm nor deny that. Who asked that question? <laughs> uh, uh, Joseph Bly. I have That's sold. I Clark Griswold is actually Christmas Vacation is literally my my favorite all time favorite movie. And Dude, literally, I, I literally based, Vacation's really good too. Well, any any of the vacation movies, I literally live my life. Like I'm Clark Griswold, and I'm not even joking. It's down to a T. In fact, I was up on the roof, and I'll, I'll share a photo. I was up on the roof this last weekend cleaning, uh, you know, like the little helicopters that come out. You know, so I was cleaning out my gutters, and um, 
I took a photo, but I, my wife should have took a video of me in action. So she's actually down on the ground and I'm up on the roof. Oh but I was gosh. literally going like I was Clark Griswold with a broom on the roof, like I was going to fall off almost. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, if you don't live your life like Clark Griswold, I don't know what type of man you are. Uh, I'm more of a Cousin Eddie kind of guy, personally. <laughs> Do you wear a dickie under your shirt? That's <laughs> I would say. I would say I live my life a little more like like cousin Eddie personally. <laughs> <laughs> oh shoot, that's funny. Uh, I love tangents. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> warranty. Uh, the Sega Max has a one year warranty. Um, so yep, uh, one year warranty. What about the Verabilt? Verabilt is still a one year warranty. There, except for the consumable items. So the consumable items. And uh, this goes for both printers would be like the resin vat, the, the vat film, the LCD screen on the Verabilt is not, I mean, that's not a recovered warranty item. The build plate, that's not a covered item that's consumable. Um, and that's it. Oh, and yep. the resin, there's no warranty on resin. No warranty on resin. It's absurd. Okay, get those questions in, or hey, you know what? If you want us to banter about something else stupid, uh, get that into because Lord knows we're willing to to uh, grind each other's gears a little bit. Uh, you know, grinds my gears. You know, what really grinds my gears. How difficult are the LCD masks to install? Hmm. How difficult are the LCD masks to install in the uh, bear build? It takes literally probably i mean with with me doing because i've done it a couple times uh just from different training presentations and so on and so forth i can get that knocked out in probably three minutes so what about and a new user three minutes and one second and it's a <laughs> um it's a it's 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 four screws so it's two on each side so there's two screws on the right side two screws on the left side and then what is actually holding down the the screen there's a, a tin bezel that it's four screws you take those out and then it's just pop it off put the new one in pop it back in reassemble start printing. Yeah. and what's like the life one you're looking at about three to four months roughly um i have seen some go out as fast as two months but that is because we were literally putting the printer through hell um and uh it may be even longer than four months. It all depends on your use. So if you're if you're printing 24/7 nonstop like what we do in our R&D lab, you're looking at about three to four months. Um, okay, we got to answer this one, guys. We have to take this question. What is the best craft beer in Kentucky? Now, Corey and I are in the same building, so there might be some fisticuffs going down here. Luckily, Brandon is about five miles away from us, so he's going to be safe. But Corey and I are about to get into a fight. Just saying. The best, the best Kentucky beer, it's Kentucky Bourbon Barrel Ale. I agree. That's that's a lot of that's a lot of people's favorites. I really, uh, you know, I it's hard to say my favorite cr local craft beer because like there's different categories. I mean, there's so many different types of beer. Like I, you know, what's my favorite local IPA? Or I don't, I don't know. I'm I'm a big fan of Against the Grain Brewery. I I, I like a lot of their beers. Um, I think it's pretty good. Um, obviously Kentucky Bourbon Barrel Ale is really good. Um, but you know I'm kind of new to Kentucky, so I'm still kind of getting getting familiar with some of the some of the local beers. My my all-time favorite beer I think is from Colorado, and it's White Rascal from Avery uh, out in Boulder. Phenomenal. If any of you people are in Colorado, that's, that's a that good a, one. That was a tangent within a tangent. Mm -hmm. We just went tangent inception. Mm -hmm. hands down, um, it's, it's Kentucky Burn Bill. I think we have um uh, uh do we have another one? What precautions do we need to take when handling the resin material? Uh, gloves at all times. Um I am a rebel and I did not put gloves on today, but you want to wear gloves at all times because it, when it's in the liquid state, it is toxic material and so you could potentially develop a rash or have some sort of allergic reaction to it. Good question. Well, um, I think that's um, yeah. I think that's all the questions at this point in time. Uh, I just want to thank you all once again for attending uh, these training sessions with us. It's uh, it's been a pleasure. We're gonna do 
you know, we're gonna have a training session again, training session number or number three, which will be the final set for it. It's gonna be, um, it's gonna be at the, uh, sorry, it's gonna, I just got a text message. We got a couple more questions, so we gotta make sure we get those in. Um, the, uh, I forgot where I was going. Oh, step three is gonna be the actual finishing part of the, uh, temporary material. So we're going to cover the post-processing from the print. So after the print, how to clean it and then how to properly cure it and then how to remove the supports properly and so on and so forth. And then uh, maybe do a little characterization for it. Uh, and if not, show at least a definitely a faster way to uh, getting that final polish on the material itself. So uh, let's see. Yep. Was there get, some... those, get those final uh, beers, I mean, questions in. <laughs> Uh, let me see uh, here. Uh, something about there's some questions on loaners, maybe. Let's see. Maybe it's up at the top. Yeah, you provide loaners. Uh, let me see. Where is that? Um, we do provide loaners. However, you have to be in the uh, service level agreement that allows it. So if you have a machine and it goes down, if you do not have or if you're not part of the SLA agreement, if you did not pay for that extra extra special package, you will not be part of the, uh, you will not have access to a loaner. Uh, we will print for you at cost. That is not a problem. So if you do not pay for that upgraded channel, uh, we'll still print for you, but it's going to be at the cost of the material. Uh, you won't be have access to the loaner. And that's in and out of warranty. Yeah. Um, do then, the, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Nope, you go ahead. Uh, do the printing units come with a an alcohol bath unit as well? Um, no. That's a no. Um, honestly, uh, you can get you can get really um, really decent ultrasonic units on Amazon um, uh, for pretty inexpensive. Um, just throw that out there. Um, guys, <laughs> a little more. So out, was there one on layer thickness as well? Maybe. Would be oh yeah, for the oh. the base base plate layer thickness recommend recommendation. Oh, I I always do 0.3. Um, it's really up to yourself. I mean, there's I do 0.3 just because I know it's for sure going to be there. Um, you can do uh 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. You, I think you can go all up to two millimeters. So it's really yep. at your discretion. Uh, how much is the light curing unit? Well, um, the Asiga comes with the Asiga flash curing unit. Um, however, since we're talking about today's webinar in the context of the temporaries, Corey, was it the Uvitron that was the recommended or the indicated yeah. curing unit? So there's two Uvitron models. There's the Sunray and the Intelleray. Um, I'm kind of blanking on the prices of those, though. Do you know? Do you know them off the top I of your head? I want to Corey? say you're depending on which one you get at the, I think the price is start about $4,000 roughly. Okay. Um, you will want to ask, you know, you will want to contact your sales rep uh, directly. So if it's Sherry Weatherby um, or Chris Fry, you'll want to contact your rep to make sure that you get the appropriate pricing for it. Yep. Cool. Um, I think that's everything. Let's go back up to the top of the list. Oh, you know what? It's, um, the curing unit is $3,500 or $4,000. Uh, Sherry actually just commented, and thank you, Sherry. We appreciate it. That was for uh, William. He had the question on. Um, so when you're all said and done, if you wanted to get into doing temporaries or dentures from the Denko material, if you have the Asiga printer, you're going to be looking at a minimum of about $14,500. 14, if you have the Verabuild printer, you're looking at a minimum of, of roughly $7,000. Uh, and that's just to do the digital dentures or digital temporaries uh, to be able to, to get into that to that game. All good questions. Awesome. Um, so I think that's everything that uh, everything that I see coming down the pipeline. Uh, once again, thank you all again for attending. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been fun. You know, we'll, we'll yeah. do it again on Friday, and then next week I think we're doing uh, screw retain design so that's gonna be really exciting it's gonna be with bryce hiller and evan kemper uh brandon thank you again for uh, attending and and charming us with your your beautiful haircut i admire it i think it's gorgeous you know i think it's um you know this is literally literally the best haircut to have during this whole uh situation that we're in 
in today's day and age. It's very aerodynamic. Go for speed. I need my, I need my barber to reopen. I need, <laughs> I've got like a, I've got like a, like a fro going on over here on the side. It's not good. Awesome. Thank you all for attending. We appreciate it. And we'll see you yeah. on Friday. Thanks yeah. everyone.